Come on, Substance, make some noise wherever you are at. You made it to church, and we are so blessed you did. Uh, I'm Pastor Peter Haas, and we're just going to have some fun today. And many of you guys know over the years, our, our church is kind of a different church. We do things a little differently here. And, and uh, one of the things that has always been really, really critical to me is being a church that is engaging outsiders, that's engaging people that don't normally go to church. I know this is going to sound kind of sad, but did you know that less than 1% of evangelical and charismatic churches even uh, have conversion? growth in their churches. There's churches, not a whole lot of churches are growing, but even the ones that are growing are basically just growing by sucking Christians out of another church. And it's really, it's just consumerism. And so one of the things that we've always determined as a church is that we just want to be a church that reaches people who normally don't want to go to church, okay? And and one of the things that I do is I always try to surround myself with, with pastor friends who are knocking it out of the park and doing kind of similar things. Things. And so about 13 years ago, I, I met a pastor by the name of Matt Keller, who literally was born within 24 hours of myself. Come on. W- what was going on on that date? I'm just saying, Matt, I don't know, but I just, there's something special. And uh, no, I'm kidding. Anyway, but I, I like literally, uh, like when I got to know this church, Next Level Church in Fort Myers, Florida, I thought, my goodness, these guys are are killing it in their city. They're doing amazing things and, of course, just growing. And and ever since that moment when I met him, I'm like, you know what? We just need to do life with one another. We need to kind of, like, the way we do things, we need to, like, rub off on each other. And so over the years, we've been pulpit swapping for now, I don't know, 10 to over 10 years now. I think about how our kids have kind of grown up together. And um, many of you guys also know that Pastor Matt is one of the overseers here at Substance, which means uh, in our church polity, that basically means that he's one of those pastors where we let him come in and just evaluate the health in every different area of our church. And so just to make sure that everything is is on the up and up. And of course, just he's become really not just a friend uh, of Carolyn and I, but just he's really kind of an adjunct teaching pastor right here at Substance. And so guess who's going to be bringing the word today? Would you guys give it up for Pastor Matt Keller as he brings the heat? What's up, Substance? If you're glad you can be at church, say yeah. yeah. Come on, I am glad to be here uh, all the way from Fort Myers, Florida. But I just got to be honest with you, it's cold here. No, really, like my, Sarah and I are here, obviously, with our boys, uh, Will and Drew, two teenage boys. And uh, we went to the Twins game last night with the Hosses and uh, Party in Nine. And thank goodness it was free stocking cap night at the Twins game. <laughs> Because we were cold. Like, it's, it's, it's just, it's good. I'm glad Peter and I are the same size because I own a sweater. No coats. Like, I mean, like, it's, it's so, whenever we get here, we're like, hey, man, I'm going to need some warm clothes. So, man, it is great to be here. And as Pastor Peter said, it just, it's, there's just, uh, friends like the Haas's. Uh, and the Kellers are rare. And I hope you have friends in your life like we have friends in our life. And we're just so thankful for them. We just love that our kids have kind of all grown up together. And uh, and they just are like long-lost cousins. And as soon as they get back together, they just, boom, they're back in. And they just kind of comma and, and they just pick up. We all do. We just pick up where we left off. And we love Substance Church. Uh, I'm glad to be here uh, with all of you today. And I believe that God has brought me here uh, to, to to speak a word to us. And so I, I want to I want to speak a word to us individually, okay? So come on, lock eyes with me for just a second. I need, I need you to, to, are you ready for a personal word from the Lord today? Come on, how many know that God's word is the inspired word of God, the Bible? We believe that around here, and we just believe that God wants to speak to us individually, and you know, God will take us to stories that maybe we've heard before in our past, uh, and God will just, will quicken something new, a, a fresh perspective, a fresh revelation from his word, his timeless word that just can speak to our heart, and that's what I believe God wants to do. So if you're ready for that, would you just pray with me? God, open our hearts, Lord. We open our hearts to you. And Father, you see each and every one of us who come into our Northtown location, each and every one of us who come into our downtown location at at Historic Wesley. And Father, we just welcome you in today. We invite you, God, we give you permission to do in our heart what you want us to do. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, 
Amen. First Samuel chapter 1 is where we're going to land. First Samuel chapter 1, so if you have a Bible or if you have a smartphone, turn with me, click with me there. Uh, the verses will be on the screen as well, so don't, if you don't have either of those, don't worry, you can follow along. Uh, so let me ask, start by asking us a question. How do you define yourself? How do you define yourself? How, how do you like to define yourself? Let me flip the question over. How do the people around you define you? How do the people around, uh, let let me narrow it a little bit. How do we hope the people around us define us? Have you ever thought about that? How do you hope the people around you define you? Oh, Matt, oh, you mean the skinny one? Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about, right? Like, that's how I hope people define me, right? I hope it's not, oh, Matt, oh, the heavy set guy? That's not me. Like, I, just, I hope they're not talking about this Matt, right? Like, someone's, oh, oh, Matt, oh, the successful one. Oh, Matt, oh, you, oh the dad? Are you talking about you two boys? Oh, oh, that guy? Oh, oh, are you talking about her? Oh, the, oh, the pretty one? Oh, the skinny one? Oh, the, oh, the smart one. You're ta- oh, wait, 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 are you talking about the girl down the hall that, that she's real smart? How do, how do we hope people define us? Hopefully, we hope people don't define us as the obnoxious one or the annoying one. Oh, you mean the annoying guy in the office? Oh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Go ahead. Right? Maybe it's the nice dress one or maybe it's the liberal one or the conservative one, the opinionated one, the mean one, the, the, the driven one, the talented one, the busy one. See, all of us define ourselves by some things. And all of us want to be defined by others as some things. And where I want us to look today is the story of a woman named Hannah. Everyone say Hannah. We're going to look at this famous story. And again, maybe you're familiar with Bible study. Maybe you've heard this story a million times. Maybe you've never heard this story before. But in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1, we find the story of a woman named Hannah. And Hannah wants to be defined by something that she doesn't yet have. Let's pick up a little of the backstory, starting in verse 1. Let's, let's look at it together. Here's what it says. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah. Everyone say Elkanah. Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Well, why didn't you just say that to begin with? Really? We had to go through all of that? Okay, so there's a guy named Elkanah, and he's fr- from... The line of Ephraim. Thanks. Boom. Verse 2. He had two wives. I ain't preaching on that today. Uh -uh, Uh-uh. Uh-uh. We're just going to have to let Pastor Peter discern that one a little later. Not today. He had two wives. One was called Hannah. Everyone say Hannah. And the other, Peninnah. Peninnah had children. But Hannah had none. This little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed home. This little piggy ate roast beef. This little piggy ate none. Peninnah had kids. Hannah has none. Verse 3. Year after year, this man, Elkanah, went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, not Phinehas and Ferb, this is different, Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Look at this, verse 4. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. So what's happening? Here's what happened. So so when it was time to sacrifice to the Lord, this is Old Testament, he would take portions of meat and he would give it to Peninnah, his one wife, and then he would say, now you give that to all of your kids and sacrifice it to the Lord. But then look at verse 5. This is what I want us to see. But to Hannah... He gave a double portion. Everyone say double portion. Because he loved her. Oh, yeah, and the Lord had closed her womb. In other words, Hannah had none. Hannah had no kids. Which in their culture, being a mom, having kids was everything. Peninnah had lots of kids. Hannah had no kids. But here's what I want you to see. Throw, throw verse 5 up there again because this is, this is really, this is where things start to light up for us. Okay, so look at verse 5. Here's what it says. 
Hannah was given a double portion. Do you know what that speaks to? That speaks to anointing and favor on her life. So Hannah was doubly favored by her husband Elkanah. And the reason why, the second thing I want you to see in this verse is she was loved. He loved her so much. The problem was Hannah didn't define herself by her double favor or the love of her husband. She defined herself by what she wasn't, which is a mom. Question, Substance, how do you define yourself? Do you define yourself by the favor of God that's on you? Do you define yourself by the love God has for you? Is that where our focus is? Or is our focus on what we don't have? Because in her world, Hannah couldn't see that she was highly favored by God. She couldn't see that, that she was highly loved by her husband, by her heavenly father. No, no, no. All she could see was that she didn't have kids. Her womb was closed. And church, listen, I wholeheartedly believe that there are many of us who are here today who need the truth that we're going to talk about to sink into our hearts because we think we're not favored or not loved because of what we don't have. And that's just not true. The Bible tells us that we serve a God of love. We serve a God who has favored us, who has blessed us in so many ways. And yet for so many of us, all we can see is what we don't have. Instead of seeing what we do have. But church, listen, just because God hasn't given you what you want, doesn't mean you're not highly favored and you're not highly loved. Hannah was living a double portion life, but she couldn't see it. All she could see was that she didn't have a son. Continues on, verse 6. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on. This isn't just a once in a while thing. No, no, no. Every single year, year after year after year, whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and could not eat. And here's what I believe. I believe that some of us listening to me today, you and I, we are like Hannah in the story. And so I want to give us five realities of our condition. Maybe you want to write these things down. Maybe you want to email yourself or text yourself or open up your notes app and write some things down. Here's the first reality of our condition. Ready? Number one, what we are not will beat us up if we let it. What we are not will beat us up if we let it. That's where, that's where Hannah was. Listen, church, it's so easy to get our eyes on what we're not that it actually interferes with what we are called to do. And some of us, that's where we find ourselves to living today. That we look at our life and we compare it to the family down the street or we compare it to the sales guy around the corner or we compare it to the mom in the the car line at school, the other moms or or on the bleachers and we, we compare ourselves to the other students in the seminary and we look at our life and all we can see is what we're not and it's become a distraction. Hannah couldn't do what she was called to do in this moment. Because of what she wasn't. Listen, what we're not will beat us up if we let it. And some of you, that's what you're, where you're living today. You're saying things like, well, I thought I'd be further than this by now. Well, I thought I thought I had more to show for my life by this point. Well, I thought I'd be paid more by now. I thought my title would be better. I thought my office would be on a higher level. I thought the sacrifices that we've made for our family would have, would have, would have would, would become less by now, not more. And see, Satan bombards us, doesn't he? And let me tell you where Satan bombards us, church. He bombards us in our beliefs. Because our beliefs determine our thoughts. And our thoughts determine our actions. And so, listen, do you want to know what the the strategy of the devil is for your and my life? Here's what it is. It's to not attack us in our actions. It's to attack us in our beliefs. Because if he can get us believing lies about ourselves, if the devil can get us believing lies about, about, about who we are, that we're not highly favored, that we're not highly loved, 
that we have an orphan spirit that we're carrying around. If the devil can get us and attack us at our belief level, then guess what? We start to believe half-truths. We start to believe false realities in our mind. And those thoughts drive our actions. So Satan doesn't need to attack us in our actions. All he has to do is attack us in our beliefs. And some of you, that's where you find, isn't it interesting that Jesus himself called Satan the father of lies? I don't know about you, but there are a lot of things that if I were naming Satan and calling him the father of something, you know what I call him? I call him the father of evil or the father of hatred, the father of violence. But Jesus, our Savior himself, decided to call Satan what? The father of lies, John 8, 44. That's crazy. But what Jesus was doing is he was revealing to us Satan's strategy. I just got to get, get people to believe something that's not true, a lie. And that's where Hannah found herself. She believes that she wasn't favored. She believes she wasn't loved because she didn't have a child. And it affected her. Look at verse 8. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? And then look at this question he would ask her. Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Wow. What a question. What a question the husband asks the wife. What a question Elkanah asks Hannah. Don't I mean more to you? To you, here's the second reality of her condition. Number two, God wants to know we love him more than just his benefits. We serve a God who wants to know that we love him more than we love what he can do for us. See, God is a jealous God, and he will never take second place to anyone or anything, including the very thing he wants to give us. Church, God wants to know that if we love him more than we love his gifts or more than we love his blessing, and he wants wants to know that we love him more than we we want what he can do for us. And this is where it gets tricky, though, isn't it? Because so many of us are doing so many good things for him. What we want, we want for him, right? Like we're leading a ministry. We're leading a small group. We're, we're serving like crazy. We're, t- we're trying to raise and promote our perfect family, right? We're working our way up the corporate ladder. We're giving our all to our schooling. Why? Because God, it's all for you. Right? Like, God, if my family's perfect, then I can post it on Facebook and all of the people will glorify you because they'll see how perfect we are. And God, if I move up the corporate ladder, I can can give more, right? If I get a raise, I can give more. I can be more generous. It's all for you. The more degrees I earn, the more capable I'll be for you. The bigger my ministry grows, the more influence I'll have for you. It's all for God, right? I just want this child for you. And that's where Hannah found herself. God, if you would just give me more, then I would just give it all back to you. That's where Hannah found herself. And Elkanah, the husband, looks right at her and says, no, 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 Hannah, hang on. Don't I mean more to you then 10 sons? Shouldn't you just love me for me? Not for the sons you want from me. That's where Hannah found herself. And 16 months ago, church, that's where I found myself. It was May of last year. May 11th, as a matter of fact, my youngest son, Drew's birthday, and I, I was scheduled to, to go on a silence and solitude retreat around our church. A lot of our high-level leaders, we, we build in these times for like two or three days where we can get away and just be silent and, and in solitude before the Lord. Just us and God. No music, no nothing. Just us and, and God. And Because here, here's what we found. We found that the voice of God gets really, really loud when the voices of the world get really, really soft. So if we can create some space for 36 or 48 or 60 hours where we can turn down the voices of distraction in the world... 
we found that God speaks pretty loud. It's pretty cool. So my heart was not in a good place. I had neglected my soul for a, a season of my life. So we had, it was a Thursday night, we had my son's birthday party, and my, my bags were all packed. And as soon as we were done with his birthday party, like at 9.30, I, I took off for the beach. And I, I, my, my heart was jacked up. Like, me and God were not, well, he knows. And so we left the house. My family prayed for me, and I get in the car, and I do what I do, and I turned on worship music, right? Because that's what you do, and you start with worship, and yeah, so I turn on some worship, input-output, right? And I get about six seconds in, and I sense in my heart God saying, turn it off, Matt. So you know how you do. I was kind of like, fine. And then I say out loud, hey, God, you have permission to rebuke me. Don't pray that. <laughs> so I get down to the beach, and I check into my room, and I have a balcony. I'm on, like, the sixth floor on Fort Myers Beach. And, and I check in, and I'm sitting on the balcony, and it's, it's like 11 o'clock at night, and, and I sense the Lord say, turn to 1 Samuel 1, Matt. And I'm like, oh, right, Hannah. Yeah, yeah, no, I know this one. Okay. Sup. up? And I get to verse 8 right here. And when I read the words where Elkanah says to his, his wife, don't I mean more to you than ten sons? The Holy Spirit speaks to my heart and says, Matt, you have loved the child of influence. Ten times more than you have loved me. And as I sat there with no lights, I had my little cell phone light shining on the Bible. I was so convicted by God. And I wrote in my journal, I am Hannah. See, I wanted so desperately to do something great for God. I wanted so desperately to have God give me influence and grow our church big and be awesome for him and speak and write and lead and be a voice of influence. I wanted all of that for God. But I found myself on May 11th, 2017, sitting on that balcony on the sixth floor in Fort Myers Beach, being convicted. And the Lord said, Matt, can you actually say that you love me ten times more than you love the child of influence that you keep begging me for? And that night, sitting on that balcony, my answer to God was, no. I don't love you 10 times more than I love what I'm trying to do for you. Verdict in, case closed, guilty. You know what the name Elkanah means, her husband's name, Elkanah? You know what it means? God creates. Think of that. The only one in the story that can do anything about helping Hannah get the child she so desperately wants is Elkanah. But Hannah's defiant attitude was declaring, I don't want God to create this. I want to create this so I can get all the credit. Verse 9, once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. Verse 10, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, look at her prayer. If you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever touch his head. Number three, declaring the uh, uh, desiring the child more than God is idolatry. 
And church, listen, I know this isn't a fun message. Listen, I wish I was up here being all hip, hip, hooray, but I'm not. This is the word the Lord put on my heart that some of us have made an idol out of the very thing we're trying to do for him. And you want it so bad. And God's going, I don't want you to want it. I want you to want me. How many if you will only prayers have we prayed? God, if you will only, then I will. God goes, I don't care. That's where Hannah was. God, if you'll just give me this, then I, ooh, wow, you really would? All for me? He's not impressed. He doesn't want us to want it. He wants us to want him. And that's where I found myself. And that's where Hannah found herself. Verse 12, as she kept praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Look at this. Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, woman, what are you doing coming to church drunk? Put away your wine. Number four, at some point we got to get honest about our true self. At some point, we got to get honest. Here's why. Because if we don't deal with the idolatry in our heart, it will start to resemble sin in our life. Hannah wasn't fooling the priest. He looked on and he's like, girl, you are messed up. And it's starting to look like sin. See, I thought I was fooling everybody. But can I tell you something? I wasn't. I wasn't. And after me and Jesus had some time on that beach... Guess what? I came back different. I came back different. You know what people started saying to me? I don't know what happened to you, but man, something's different. Something's different. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. I'm different for sure. How long do you think you can fool everybody on Facebook? How long do you think you can fool everybody? Living for likes. Living for likes. Living for likes. Praying your if-only prayers. Verse 15, Hannah says, not so, my Lord. I am a woman who's deeply troubled. Eli the priest, you don't understand. I've not been drinking wine or beer. You know what I'm doing? I'm pouring out my soul to the Lord. She finally gets honest about where she's at. She's like, you know what? I'm willing to deplete my soul so I can have this thing that I really, really want. She was lusting in her soul after this child. Hannah wanted wanted to be known as a mom way more than she wanted to be known as Elkanah's wife. And church, that's where I found myself 16 months ago, sitting on that balcony in Fort Myers Beach going, God, I would rather be known as a pastor and an author and a speaker and a great leader and a movement leader and a leadership coach than I want to be known as the son of God. I had to get honest about my soul. But now Hannah's finally vulnerable. Now she's finally honest. She's starting to feel the conviction of the Lord like I was feeling on that balcony and like some of us are feeling this morning in this room. Verse 16, and she looks at Eli the priest and she says, no, 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 please don't think I'm wicked. I've been praying out of grief and anguish like I am overwhelmed. She's finally aware of the idolatry and the desire and she's willing to call it what it is. It's wickedness. And as soon as she recognizes it as wickedness, her prayer turns to anguish and grief. And finally, the comparison is gone. Finally, the desire for a child is gone. And she's like, no, no, no. God, I just got to get honest about my soul's condition, and it ain't good. And that's where I found myself, aware of my wicked condition. That I have loved the child of influence ten times more than I've loved God, the giver of the child. And that night on the balcony, God so convicted my heart. And he gave me this picture. He showed me 
like this picture of, of like that, that God had given me like this bag of candy, like 3,000 pieces of candy, which we have about 3,000 people in our church. And so, and if you know me at all, you know sugar's my love language. So like when God's going to speak, it's probably going to look like Skittles. I'm just telling you. It's just kind of how the Lord does it. So on that balcony that night, I felt like the Lord just gave me like this picture of God, like just giving me this bag of 3,000 pieces of candy. And, and I grab the bag and I run into my room and I slam the door behind me and I sit down on the floor next to the bed and I start to consume this candy. Meanwhile, God, my father, is standing, knocking at the door going, can I come in? Can I enjoy the candy with you? And I'm like, no, no, I don't, no, just bring me more. Just bring me more candy. In substance, I believe some of us, that's where you're living. You don't see yourself as highly favored, double portion. You don't even see yourself living in the love of God. All you care is that my womb is closed, and God, I want what I want. And that's where Hannah found herself. And she acknowledges the idolatry and she repents of it and she says, please do not see me as wicked. That's not what's going on. Oh my gosh, I can, she now sees the error of her ways and she says, I'm overwhelmed with grief and anguish. And then look what the priest says to her. Verse 17, Eli answered, go in peace. Look at this, and may. You know what the word may is short for? Maybe. Maybe the God of Israel will grant you what you've asked of him. Maybe. And then look at verse 18. I love this. I love this. She says back to the priest, may your servant find, look what she's finally focused on, favor. Oh, <laughs> I finally see it. I've been living under double portion favor already. It's not about what I have or don't have. It's about who I am in him. I am loved by the Father. I am favored by the Father. Even though my outward circumstances may not look like it. May your servant find favor in your eyes. And then look at the result. I love this. Then she went her way ate something, ha ha, and her face was no longer downcast. Everything changed when she stopped focusing on what she didn't have and started focusing on who she was. So what about us? Where's your focus? Is it on the Father? Or is it on the child you want? God doesn't want us to want it. He wants us to want him. And some of us have been so focused on the child, so focused on the job, so focused on the promotion that God's going, hey, would you just look at me? Would you just rest in peace? Would you just find peace in your soul? Not because of what you have or don't have, not because of where you are or where you aren't in your life right now. Would you just focus and rest in my peace in your heart? Because you're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You're highly favored of God. God, that's who you are. Well, that, can we just be okay with that being enough? 16 months ago, that's where I found myself. And God changed everything. And no longer am I searching for the child of influence. I'm going to leave that all to him. Regardless of outcome, number five. God wants us to live in peace, regardless of the outcome. Resting in the favor of God. Resting in our position as sons and daughters of God. Yes, that is what we are, 1 John says. Are you ready? Are you ready to give up the striving 
Are you ready to just be okay with being highly favored and greatly loved? I have a feeling making that decision right now can change everything. So come on, across this room, across every room we're in, can we just bow our heads before we move on with our time together? I just want to pray. Because some of us have had our eyes on the wrong thing. Some of us have been lusting for the child in whatever way that looks like. And we've even been, been fooling ourselves to believe, well, it's, just, it's all for him. It's all for his glory. But seated right where you are, God wants to change your focus today. He wants you to fall ten times more in love with him than your wildest dream of what he could do for you. So, God, we open our hearts seated right where we are. And Lord, we believe that it's not a coincidence, it's not an accident, it's a divine setup that you have brought us into this place today to speak to us. And now, Lord, I pray that you would change us like you changed me on that balcony 16 months ago. God, change us that we would no longer just desire what you can do for us, but we would just desire you. God, help us to begin to fall 10 times more in love with you than we are with what you can do for us. God, would you begin to change our beliefs instead of seeing and defining ourselves by what we're not? Lord, would you start to help us to define ourselves by what we are? Lord, every morning we can wake up and say, I am highly favored and I am greatly loved. I'm highly favored and I'm greatly loved. I'm highly favored and I'm greatly loved. God, thank you that you love us. Thank you that we are highly favored. Thank you, God. And now, Lord Jesus, we repent. Lord, we just begin to confess. Come on, seated right where you are. Just begin to speak it out just under your breath. Just, God, I'm sorry. God, forgive me for lusting after that. God, forgive me for chasing after that. God, forgive me for putting that above you, Lord, putting anything above my love for you. God, forgive us of that. Lord, forgive us of, of striving. God, forgive us of, of wanting that more than we want you. God, just forgive us right now, Lord. Forgive us. Wash us clean. Jesus, forgive us. We want to leave this place changed, God. Like God left the beach changed. God, we want to be changed. We want to be known as Elkanah's wife more than we want to be known as a mom. We want to be known as a son of God, a daughter of God, more than we're known for anything else. God, change us, we ask. Thank you for speaking to us. We receive your word now, and we will leave different with our eyes on you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody who agreed said, Amen.